Um, well, you know, we this was advertised as container gardening and butterfly gardening and all that stuff. Uh, and all that stuff is going to be contained uh, in this this talk. I have found that making a butterfly garden, making a container garden is not the issue. That's easy to do those things. The real challenge is convincing people to do that. So we're going to spend some time on why we need to, to start putting more natives into our life. Before we do that, though, um, let me ask you what this is. <laughs> kind of looks like a fecal sac. You know, birds don't want their babies to poop in the nest. So they have evolved a little sack, the poops go into it and the parents pick it up and fly out from the nest and then just drop it and it splats on a leaf. And it looks a lot like that, uh, but that's not a fecal sack. That is a bola spider trying to look like a fecal sac. You know, if you look like a fecal sac, nothing's gonna, gonna eat you. But at night, it looks like a real spider. It hangs from a leaf and it drops a single strand of, of silk <clears throat> with one sticky glob of glue at the end there and it goes hunting. Now, you wouldn't think anything would fly into that, but they do. Moths fly in and get stuck, and the spider spins them around very quickly, wraps them up in silk, uh, and then has a nice meal. Then she catches another moth and has a nice meal. Then she catches another moth uh, until she gets enough energy to make an egg mass. This is a silken egg mass. All the eggs are in the center there, and that's how they spend the winter. And if she catches enough moths, she'll make two or three egg masses and hang them all next to each other. And you can go out, you can find these egg masses hanging from, from branches um, all winter long. Well, the real question is, why are moths flying into this single target? You'd think a, a web would be a much better uh, way to go hunting, but they're not doing it by accident. This spider is releasing the sex pheromone of a particular species of moths. So all the moths that fly in are males. They thought she was a female. She is, but the wrong species. Uh, and that's the end of them. But I was curious to find out what species of moth the bola spiders in my yard were attracting. So I unwound the little bodies that she would cut loose and found it's the bronze cutworm. And I've got bronze, bronze cutworm adult moths because I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars and I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars because I've got their main host plant, goldenrod. I also have uh, this beautiful moth, the dot line white because I've got oak trees, particularly white oaks, which they love. And because I don't rake the leaves away from under those leaves, there is a dot line white cocoon in this leaf mass. And I guarantee you don't see it. And there's no way you would see it when you're raking leaves. There it is right there. And if we enlarge it, it's right there. Again, there's a lot of living things in these leaves that it's extremely easy to miss when we rake our leaves away and dispose of them. I've got evening primrose moths because I've got evening primrose. And I've got evening primrose because I planted it. I wanted to attract that moth and the moth did come. It spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it's always very cute. I've got zebra swallowtails because I planted pawpaws for the express purpose of, of attracting zebra swallowtails. Uh, it would take me a long time to describe all of the species that are now uh, making a living, calling our property home. It would not take me very long to describe what's happening in a typical residential landscape. Uh, there is no goldenrod, so there's no bronze cutworm, so there's no bola spiders. There's no uh, oak trees, so there's no dot line whites. There's no evening primrose, so there's no evening primrose moth. Uh, there's no pawpaws, so there's no zebra swallowtail, on and on and on. There's very little that can survive in a typical residential landscape, and we've got 135 million acres of typical residential landscapes in the U.S., and we're not through. We're developing 800,000 acres of natural areas, converting them into developed areas uh, every single year in, in the U.S. And that's one of the reasons we're seeing headlines like this, disturbing headlines, like the insect apocalypse is here, talking about global insect decline. North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Two thirds of Earth's wildlife is already gone. The UN says we're gonna lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years. 40% of Earth's plants face extinction. Terrible, terrible news. And that's why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write this book, The Sixth Extinction, talking about the sixth great extinction event that the planet has ever experienced. But this of course is the first one to be caused by a living being. Uh, now, people are upset about this, uh, and, and scientists are actually studying what our reaction to biodiversity losses, uh, what those reactions are. Richard Hobbs thinks that uh, they're very close to the five stages of grief that we experience when we hear we have a terminal disease. First, there's denial. We certainly see a lot of denial out there. We don't have a problem at all. Anger, 
I feel that sometimes. Bargaining, oh, maybe it's not so bad. Maybe we can do something. Depression, there's a lot of that going around. And stage five is acceptance. Well, this is where we have to push back. Acceptance is equivalent to giving up. And giving up is not an option because giving up on nature is not an option. Nature is not optional. It's essential to our own survival. So we need a, a sixth stage, and I'm going to suggest action. There really are things we can do to stem the tide of, of uh, biodiversity loss. Now, we do have parks. We have preserves. Uh, our national parks in particular were established primarily because they were gorgeous places. We wanted to preserve the exquisite scenery that they offered. Uh, and Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to do with that. This is what he said. He said, the establishment of the National Park Service is justified by considerations of good administration. So he's patting himself on the back as he, as he should. Uh, of the value of natural beauty as a national asset uh, and of the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenship. In other words, our parks were created because they were pretty places for us to play in. They were not created with conservation in mind. And that's one of the reasons we only have 3.6% of the U.S. in national parks. If we compare that to a uh, country like Coast, Costa Rica, they have, I don't know what, 25%, 23%, something like that of their country in, in national parks. Only 12% of our country is federally protected, which means 88% is not. But people wonder, why aren't the parks and preserves that we have enough to sustain the biodiversity that we humans need? And there's several answers to that, but the big one, is that they're too small. When you take large areas like this and you shrink them down to uh, tiny remnants of, of their former selves, and this is an exaggeration, you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small or tiny populations. And that is the primary problem because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up. and bad times, they go down. If you're a large population, this top line, even in your down cycle, there's enough individuals so when times get better, you can increase quickly again. But if you're a tiny population, often in those normal population fluctuations, you hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch, and then you're gone. Unless you recolonize that habitat patch, and, and that's getting harder and harder to do. Picture a box turtle crossing Route 95. Not going to happen. Then you're permanently gone. That's called local extinction. And studies all over the world, some of them quite long, over 100 years in length, are telling us the same thing. We have not left enough natural areas on the planet to sustain the amount of nature that we need. Now we tend to use extinction as a metric of trouble, um, but I don't, I don't like that <clears throat> because that's like going to the doctor after you're you're dead. Um, we need to address this problem before things are extinct. So, defaunation. Uh, is probably the term we should be be using. The loss of of what once were common species. Uh, the populations are, are degraded to just a few individuals. So for example, the American chestnut used to be a dominant tree along the crest of the Appalachians from Maine all the way down to Georgia. Then we brought in the chestnut blight and it took them all out. Now they're not extinct. There are still sprouts coming up from, uh, from rootstocks that, that uh, are still alive in there, but they're functionally extinct. They're not performing their roles in their, their ecosystem anymore. Rusty patch bumblebee used to be one of the most common bees uh, in, across the continent. Now, if you find one, it's a big deal because they are on the brink of, of extinction. American beaver, now they're not extinct and they're actually coming back in a few places. But when Europeans came to North America, beavers were everywhere and they established the hydrology of the entire continent. And then we trapped just about all of them out, changing the hydrology of the entire continent, not for the better. Um, so the, that hydrology has still changed. We allow beavers to go uh, in certain places until they act like beavers, and then we remove them. But, so we're really talking about defaunation, whoops, the reduction in the abundance of species that run ecosystems. That's the real problem. It's local, it's everywhere, and we tend not to even notice it. And we tend not to notice it because of something called shifting baseline. There's this condition where we think that the way things are when we are kids, the way the, the, the environment we were born into is normal. That's the way things ought to be because it's all we've ever experienced. So if we're born into a, a world that's defaunated into one where there's very few things where we live, we think that's normal. And if we think it's normal, we don't get upset by it and we don't tend to, to uh, try to do anything about it. None of us miss the passenger pigeon. 
uh, what was the most common bird in the entire world because it was extinct before any of us were, were born. So shifting baseline means that we're losing biodiversity. It's the biodiversity that sustains us and we don't even notice it. Uh, Edwin Way Teal said it, said it best decades ago. He said, we simply cannot make the world uninhabitable for other forms of life and we have it remain habitable for ourselves. It's so true. So what should we do? Um, well, you know, there's there's good news. Um, this is is now a recognized problem worldwide. The UN took it up as a, as an issue uh, last year at uh, meetings in Montreal. You know, big big uh, UN meetings on biodiversity crisis. This is a um, a headline that came out of that meeting. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. We're negotiating whether or not we're going to protect the stuff that keeps us alive on this planet. And you know what? Um, at the end of the negotiations, the UN makes resolutions, which we ignore. So I'm not counting on the UN's resolutions to, to change much. E.O. Wilson, very famous professor at, at Harvard, the late E.O. Wilson, I should say. He died two years ago. But he was concerned about the loss of biodiversity throughout his extremely long 60-year career. Uh, and in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. And he had one simple message. He said, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we're going to have to save nature. We're going to have to save functional ecosystems on at least half of the planet, or it will disappear everywhere. And that includes humans. Very bold statement. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time telling us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Um, of course, to a conservation biologist, it's a great idea. We'll just put half the planet aside and all those things that are in trouble can be in that half. We humans can be in the other half and, and it'll be wonderful. The problem is half of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture. Uh, and I don't see us getting rid of that. And we got 8 billion people and all of our, our hardscape, our roadways, our airports and detritus in the other half. And we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we realize E.O. Wilson's dream? Well, I think we can. I think we can. But we need a new approach to conservation to do that. We have to give up the idea that humans and nature cannot coexist. We've held on to that idea for, for centuries. Uh, nature's always been someplace else. Um, but it's, there is no someplace else anymore. So now we're going to have to to learn to coexist. What I want to argue today is that uh, not only is living with nature an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. So instead of just practicing conservation here, we need to practice it here. But look, there's nothing to conserve here. So we have to go beyond conservation into restoration. We have to put it back. We have to put it back. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, not get diminished every year, but thrive. So here's the problem. Um, fragmentation. There are, there are viable habitats out there, but we have shrunk them down to little teeny fragments of their former selves and they're isolated from each other which means the populations within those fragments are tiny. So when they fluctuate, they tend to disappear. So what's been proposed is building biological carters that connect those isolated fragments. So the plants and animals can move back and forth between viable habitats. Um, this will reduce uh, inbreeding uh, and, it, and it seems like a good idea. The problem is the populations are still tiny. So when they fluctuate, they'll still disappear. Uh, so I think we need to go beyond biological carters. We need to create viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. This is better. This is even better. The light areas here would be areas where, you know, we have our cities and our agriculture. But for the most part, we're talking about filling in what is now no man's land in between viable parks and preserves. But to achieve that, I mean, what is here? It's our private property. We, we all own this part of the earth. So we need to think uh, again about our attitude towards property rights. You know, we all believe that when we own a piece of the earth, it's it's ours. We can do whatever we want with it. Um, you know, this is our this is our kingdom, and we're the kings. But our yards are not like Las Vegas. You know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. 
But what happens in our yards does not stay in our yards. Whatever we do to our properties impacts the local ecosystem and then all the plants and animals and people around us. That's the big take home here. Your party, par property is part of the local ecosystem. So let's think about <clears throat> what happens when, when we decide we're gonna have a big lawn. Well, the amount of lawn that we have will determine whether rain infiltrates when it falls or whether it leaves a stormwater runoff. It's gonna determine whether we're polluting our, our uh, local watershed because all the stuff we put on our lawn, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the herbicides, the insecticides, uh, so much of it washes off into the local watershed, polluting it. How much lawn we have is gonna determine how much carbon we're adding to the atmosphere every time we, we mow that lawn. It's gonna determine how well we're supporting pollinators because lawns eliminate the resources that pollinators need. Uh, and of course, the, if we have lawn instead of big trees, we're deciding, um, we're, we're determining how much carbon our yards are pulling out of the atmosphere. This tree is built out of tons and tons of carbon uh, that was built from carbon dioxide removed from the atmosphere out of harm's way. And then of course, its root system is pumping carbon into the ground every single day. And then finally, the plants we put on our properties are going to determine whether we're harboring ecological tumors like a calorie pear and so many other invasive plants that don't stay in our yard, they escape and then, then um, ecologically castrate the, the local land around us. And finally, our landscapes are going to determine whether we're using the plants that, that uh, support a food web, whether they pass on part of their energy uh, or not. So in short, how we landscape, how much lawn we have is going to determine um, what, how much life the earth can sustain. It's going to determine the local carrying capacity uh, of, of the land around us. And that is an awesome responsibility. And it's an awesome responsibility that typical homeowners do not know that they have. But it also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis. There are a lot of us out there, millions and millions and millions of, of people who can act on property they own or volunteer and help on practice, property they don't own. Uh, most of the country, particularly the lower 48 states, is privately owned. 78% of the country is privately owned. 85.6% of the country east of the Mississippi is privately owned, which means collectively property owners, the people who own those properties are now the hope and future of conservation. Because if we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And we can't afford to fail. Let's return to, to uh, lawn. It is the low hanging fruit. It's something we all can do something about uh, without getting permission from anybody. We now have more than 44 million acres of lawn, which uh, is bigger than all of New England combined, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Why do we do that? Well, it's a status symbol and we have to display our, our Halloween decorations. But what if we cut that area of lawn in half? Um, let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres of lawn. We're gonna cut that in half. That's enough to create a new uh, national Park that I am calling Homegrown National Park, and it will be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains, add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park be the biggest park in the country. We now have a, a small nonprofit, homegrownnationalpark.org. What you do is you register your property on the map, where it is, the location, and the amount of area you're going to be a good steward of. Uh, maybe, you're, maybe you are going to put in a pollinator garden. Maybe you're going to reduce the area of lawn. Maybe you're going to uh, start some container gardening. It doesn't matter how small it is, but um, you put that area in and then you're piece of your county, your little piece of the county you live in is going to light up with a firefly. And you get to see who else has joined Homegrown National Park uh, in, in uh, your county. The object, of course, is to get the message that we're all responsible for good earth stewardship to go viral. We want the entire country to light up. So our mission is to motivate millions of people to regenerate biodiversity by planting natives, removing invasive plants, and thus reshaping our relationship with nature. Here are our current parks. Parks. Um, so, you know, we want to take this and we want to turn it into that. Shouldn't be hard.
So what are we asking? We really are asking people to reduce the area of lawn. Lawn doesn't accomplish any of the ecological goals that we need to accomplish. We want to put the native plants in uh, in place of that lawn uh, that do accomplish those goals. Again, we want to remove invasive plants. Um, and if we're protecting any natural areas, we want to keep doing that. There are real ecological products associated with homegrown national park. Significant increase in biodiversity, and we'll give you some examples of that in a minute. Measurable reduction in invasive species. If everybody removed the invasive plants from their property, and most people have them without even knowing it, um, well, if we did that all over the country, we'd be 78%. If we did it in the East, we'd be 80, 85% done. Very good first step. Significant drawdown in atmospheric CO2. When you replace lawn with a planting like this, wonderful butterfly garden like this, uh, you are sequestering a whole lot more carbon than, than lawn does. So you're helping climate change. And you're also building viable habitat outside of parks and preserves. Every bit of, of uh, conservation we do outside of a park helps conservation inside of a park. They're important sociological products too, because this really is a sociological problem. How do we get people to do this? Well, national awareness, not just of what the problem is, but what the solutions are and what our roles in those solutions are. We are trying to change the culture. We want people to recognize that nature is not optional. It's essential. It's essential for everybody, which means everybody owns responsibility to sustaining it. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action's even better. And we want to merge all of the existing conservation organizations that are out there, Audubon and National Wildlife Federation and Wild Ones and all the land conservancies, Sierra Club, onto one visual that we call the biodiversity map. You know, we have this 30 by 30 initiative. We're trying to save 30% of the U.S. by 2030. That is not going to happen unless we record conservation that is already happening on private property. So if we're going to take areas like this and turn them into that, we're going to have to take that and turn it into that. Uh, and we do that by putting the plants back. Hunger National Park is free. You join it without uh, any money at all, which means we have no income. And that's that's an issue. So we're entirely supported by your generosity. Um, so I look forward to your generosity. There is urgency in enacting the homegrown national park solution. Remember that 135 million acres in residential landscape, that's a big job. So we all need to get to work, but we need to know what it is we're supposed to be doing. So how do we know what to do to succeed? Well, we need to understand the four things that every property needs to accomplish. Every single property that's out there has to support a viable food web, which means you have to choose the right plants that do that. Every property has to remove carbon and store it um, to help climate change. Every property has to manage the watershed in which it lies. Uh, this is this is a, a neighbor down the street from me. He's destroying my watershed. Does he have the right to do that? And every property has to support pollinators. The point is, lawn does none of those things, which is why we focus on lawn, at least in the beginning. We've got to shrink the area that's in lawn. We have to choose the right plants. Plant choice matters when we choose uh, invasive plants like, like burning bush here. Um, they fall into a category we call detractors. There are three kinds of plants out there. Plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and again, plants that remove energy from local food webs, something we cannot afford to do. The very best contributor across the country is one of our oaks. They're contributing more energy uh, in 84% of the counties in which they occur uh, to food webs by far more than any other type of, of uh, plant. Now, the farther north you go, when you get up into northern Maine, for example, oaks drop out. So then you move into willows being really, really important, um, native prunus, and then finally into the conifers that are there. But in southern Maine, oaks are still in, important. Good example of a... Uh, non-contributor would be a, a ginkgo or any of the, the uh, ornamental plants we get from Asia. They're not supporting the food web. Nothing eats a ginkgo. So they're not adding any energy to the local food web. Uh, and a detractor, again, would be any of the invasive plants that we brought in. Not only are they not adding energy to local food webs, uh, but they displace the native plants that do add energy. We also need to build an appreciation for how important caterpillars are in local food webs. Now, as gardeners, we've been trying to kill caterpillars forever. Bad idea, because they are the bread and, bread and butter of local food webs. They are 
transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we design landscapes that don't have a lot of caterpillars in them, we're going to have failed food webs and eventually failed ecosystems. And that's why uh, keystone plants become essential in our landscapes. Uh, now, we, we call these plants keystone plants because they support the most caterpillars, the things that drive those food webs. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, if you take keystone plants out of your local food web, the food web collapses because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the food that supports those food webs. So think of the keystone plants and the ecological house that you're building as the two by fours that support that house. They're the support system. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do with our ornamental plants from other continents for the last century. How do you know what the best keystone plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of the most important woody plants and herbaceous plants in your county will pop up. Uh, lists are much longer than this. Uh, so the old excuse, if I don't know what to plant, uh, is just an excuse. Now you do know to, what to plant, just put in Native Plant Finder and all of this will pop up. We have to listen very carefully to what E.O. Wilson told us. He was, you know, he was just a gem of an acad academician, okay, okay. smart guy who, who uh, you know, he worked at Harvard, but he said so many very important things. This is one of them. Insects are the little things that run the world. If we lose insects, we lose everything else. Because life as we know it depends on insects. So that's a concept we have to we have to internalize. We have to stop killing our insects. And we also have to understand that most of the insects that eat plants are what we call host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. They can only eat the plants for which they have very specialized adaptations that allow them to get around plant defenses. But it takes a long period of, of, of exposure to those, those plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. Let's use the monarch butterfly as an example. Um, you know, most of us know monarchs are host plant specialists on milkweeds. And most of us know milkweeds are toxic plants. Don't eat a milkweed. If you eat enough milkweeds, it's going to stop your heart. They've got a compound in them called cardiac glycosides. And it is there to try to keep insects from eating it. And it's very good at keeping most insects from eating it. They also have sticky latex sap. That's what gives them their common name. When you break open a milkweed vein, all this white goo comes out. And when it's exposed to air, it gels. It turns into a chewing gum-like substance. And if it that gets smeared on a caterpillar's mouth parts, it glues its mouth shut. And then the caterpillar starves to death. So very effective defense. Yet monarchs have specialized on milkweeds. So they're very good at getting around those defenses. They have uh, um, enzymes, specialized enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify cardiac glycosides. They have behavioral adaptations. They snip uh, a, a, uh, the, the rib of the leaf they're going to eat and block the flow of latex sap, or they do this on the midrib halfway up so they can eat the leaf without getting their mouth parts glued together. Very specialized adaptations that allow them to take advantage of milkweed without dying. The important thing is to recognize is that 90% of the insects that eat plants have relationships with their own host plants, just like the monarch, full of specialized uh, interactions, which means if we take those plants away and replace them with plants from another continent, our insects don't have those adaptations towards those plants and the food web collapses. We have to... to uh, acknowledge how important pollinators are. Now we're doing pretty well with this. The, the country has been talking about pollinators for, uh, geez, I don't know, 15 years now at least. Um, we tend to think that, uh, you know, we, we noticed that the honeybee was was in decline. Uh, and then we noticed, gee, all of our bees are, are in decline. And this is a problem because they pollinate a third of our, our crops. Um, well, it's actually about a 12th of our crops. We need pollinators, but not just in agriculture. We need them everywhere because they're pollinating 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. A few of them are our crops, but losing pollinators is, is not an option, even if they didn't pollinate any of our crops. We have to understand how important leaves are. We call them leaf litter. 
Um, they're not litter at, at all. They're extremely valuable uh, ecological resources. These leaves contain the nutrients that our plants used the previous year, and those nutrients have to be returned to the soil. They also form a blanket over our, our uh, soil community. There are more species that live in the soil than above the soil, and those species are converting these leaves, returning the nutrients to the soil. We've got mycorrhizal fungi, fungi that are transferring the nutrients to our, our plants. So getting rid of leaves is a bad idea for, uh, from a lot of perspectives. And of course, a lot of things live in these leaves as well. And the reason we always wanna get rid of them, we say, well, our plants can't, can't grow through leaves. Uh, well, that's not true, of course. Normal layers of, of leaf litter. Who was raking the leaves before we got here? Uh, and the plants seem to do fine. So um, we really can landscape attractively by leaving the leaves in place. The plants come right up through them. Now they're not gonna come through five feet of leaves if you stack them all in one place, but this is not something you have to worry about. This is white snake root at, at my yard. I have planted none of these. So ground covers, you know, don't have to be just two inches high. Um, these are plants they are occupying the space and there's a lot of leaves right, right there. We have to understand how important light pollution is, how deadly it is to our, our insects. It's one of the major causes of insect declines uh, around the country uh, because lights kill nocturnal insects, particularly those moths that are, are making the caterpillars that run our food web. Fortunately, there is an easy solution here. If you take out the white bulb from your security light and put in a yellow bulb, you have done it because yellow wavelengths do not attract nocturnal insects. Um, so if we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we used LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars as well. Mosquito fogging, boom, big business around the country. Um, well, the mosquito foggers say, uh, it, this is okay. What we're doing is okay because what we are fogging is a natural product. It's an organic product and they are correct. It is an organic natural product. It's pyrethroids, which comes from chrysanthemums. Uh, but cyanide is a natural organic product. Ricin is a natural organic product. Uh, nicotine is a natural organic. There's countless organic products that are deadly. So I'm not sure that's a good argument. They also say totally incorrectly that this only kills mosquitoes. Um, not true. Kills all the insects it comes in contact with, including our beloved monarch. This is the result of a mosquito fogging event on Kent Island um, in the Chesapeake. There, uh, my friend picked up some, some monarchs, but there were actually thousands of dead monarchs. It was during a migration event and um, killed them all. Mosquito fogging kills all those pollinators we're trying to, to uh, save. Uh, and the interesting thing is it does not control mosquitoes. So we're, we're having this deadly effect on the biodiversity around the country for no reason. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. It's too hard. You have to kill 90% of them to get good control. Uh, and these guys kill between 10 and 50%. So they're not getting good control. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage. Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay, put it out in the sun and let it build up the population of diatoms and algae. And that is what mosquito larvae eat. So the mosquitoes, the female mosquitoes preferentially lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you buy a sheet of mosquito dunks, $12 for a season worth of control. Uh, this is Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural bacterium that only kills mosquito larvae. So you put a dunk in to your bucket uh, and you have killed the mosquito larvae. Um, I, I should say it only kills aquatic dipter and the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket is a mosquito larva. So it's targeted, it's cheap, and it's effective, particularly if everybody does it and you're not killing anything else. We have to um, understand how important small properties are. 82% of us live in cities and we don't have acres and acres and acres. Uh, but as, as Pam Carlson's house here in Chicago, um, uh, provides a good example. I can't find any words today, I'm sorry. Um, she has one tenth of an acre. It's a tiny little property that's three times smaller than the average lot size, but she has recorded 125 species of birds that have used her property because it's 100% native plants, except for this little patch of, of lawn here. Uh, so you can have attractive landscapes, all native and help biodiversity right in the middle of a city. And this is where the container gardening come in. If you live in an apartment complex with just a, a, uh, a patio or just a uh, balcony, 
Um, you can put in uh, effective container planning that attract pollinators and those migrating monarchs. They're very mobile. They can find it. Uh, and if you want to know what plants to put in your container gardens, go to our website, homegrownnationalpark.org. There's a section there on container gardening. It will tell you the best native plants to use in your eco region so that you're using appropriate plants that will be very effective, um, even if you just have a container for space. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and biodiversity. We can fight them both at the same time, and that is the conservation works. Conservation, putting the plants back. This is the Natchusa grasslands. It's 3,800 acres in Illinois. 730 native plant species now, uh, are there now. 180 species of birds have been recorded using uh, this area, and it used to be a cornfield. Nature is extremely resilient. If we, if we give it uh, the building blocks of what it needs, and that is plants, uh, it will re rebound. This is uh, where I live, where my wife Cindy and I live, um, 10 acres in um, southeast Pennsylvania, Oxford, Pennsylvania. It was a farm, very old farm, been farmed almost 300 years and the last thing they did before they they uh, sold it was to mow it for hay. So, you know, very few woody plants there, very few anything there. Uh, and when you mow for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania, you're really mowing the rootstocks of all the invasive plants, multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet, Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle. And when they stopped mowing, that's what came back. So when we actually moved in, we had 10 acres of, of this. Um, which seems pretty discouraging. And, and, and people say, well, there's no way you can get rid of all of that. It's not as hard as you think. You just get your wife to do it, which she did. That's Cindy getting rid of all that stuff. And this is what uh, our property looks like now. Uh, and, and we have put a lot of plants back. We put the native plants back. Now I have been counting the number of species of moths that are making a living in, in our on our property uh, after we put the plants back. I've been doing it for the last six years. The reason I wanted to know the number of species of moths is that it gives me a good index of how stable and how productive our, our food web is. And by productive, I mean, how many other species is it supporting? So I'm still at it, but I'm up to 1,259 moth species that are now making a living in our house because we put the plants back. And many of these are interesting things like the chinkapin uh, leaf miner. They've got great names too. The skull cap skeletonizer, the neighbor, the little devil, the horrid zaley, the forgotten frigid owlet. I always feel sorry for the forgotten frigid owlet. The visitation moth, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, and yes, there's an implicit arches as well. The snowy shouldered eclaris, the grateful midget, the morbid owlet, the pink shaded fern moth, the feeble gra uh, grass moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagotus, the cynical Quaker, the showy and emerald, the green marvel, Harris's three spot, the old wife underwing, the eyed pectes, the hog sphinx, the tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tufted bird dropping moth? It's beautiful. This is my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar. And there are hundreds more species that have come to the, to the land, the plants we put back in on our property. And people always say, well, gee, how come you have any plants at all? All those, all those moth species and all their caterpillars are gonna eat all the plants that you have. Uh, and if nothing was controlling these, that might be true, but everything's controlling. Remember caterpillars, the bread and butter of local food webs. We've got birds uh, and birds eat, particularly when they're breeding, hundreds of caterpillars every single day per bird. I'm surprised I can find any caterpillars at, at all. And we have recorded 62 species of birds that breed on our property, eating those caterpillars every single day. We also have uh, insect predators out there eating the caterpillars, things like ambush bugs and assassin bugs, predatory stink bugs. This guy sat next to this aggregation of milkweed tussock moths uh, and ate one every day. It was like a vitamin pill. And there were a lot fewer when he was finished. We've got hymenopteran parasitoids, lots of wasps out there that are laying their eggs in caterpillars, major mortality source for, for caterpillars. And we have uh, other species of wasps that um, they will sting a caterpillar and paralyze it and then carry it off to their, their mud houses. Uh, this is a mud dauber wasp. Then they lay an egg on it uh, and the egg hatches and the larva eats the, the caterpillar. If they killed the caterpillar, without paralyzing it, the caterpillar would rot before the egg even hatched. But when they paralyze it, it stays nice and fresh for their, their larvae to eat. 
We've got vertebrates that are eating a lot of the insects on our, our property, things like skunks and possums and raccoons. Foxes, 25% of a fox's diet is, is insects. And of course, we have amphibians too. We've got spring peepers. We've got toads. We've got uh, salamanders. We've got ringneck snakes. And we've got the cutest little gray tree frogs, which are actually green when they're babies. All kinds of things controlling the insects on our property. Okay, our lawn goals are too modest. Um, we have to tackle more than lawn because most of the privately owned property that's out there is in small woodlots, it's in cropland, and it's in rangeland. We got 406 million acres of woodlots managed by private citizens, not logging companies in the US. And a lot of it is in, is in Maine. And how it is managed is gonna determine its biodiversity value. Um, so there's more than one way to manage woods and the, in species, the invasive species load that's in those woodlots, again, will determine their biodiversity value. Now we do have organizations like the Foundation for Sustainable Forests, which tells us that you can harvest in two different ways. High grade harvesting where you take the very best trees uh, and leave the, the not so good trees and it gives you a great harvest once and you gotta wait 80 years or so. Or worst first selection. This is the sustainable type of harvesting where you take, you leave the best trees and you take the worst ones uh, and you do it much more often, smaller, more frequent harvests, which, which means you can sustainably harvest a woodlot forever without reducing the amount of wood in that woodlot. It's, a, it's, it's very, very interesting, very, very uh, productive. But we have to manage the invasives that are in our woodlots. This is a, a park near me, White Clay Creek State Park. And what you're looking at is totally invasive plants from Asia. I know that because they leaf out before plants from North America. And I took this picture in March before any of our North, North American plants had leafed out. So about a third of the vegetation in so many woodlots across the country uh, is non-native, not supporting our local food web. Uh, so how do we manage these things? Well, to try to pull them all out without managing overabundance of deer uh, is counterproductive. These guys are creating most of the problem. I know it's not their fault. We got rid of their predators, but they eat the native plants and they don't eat the non-native plants, which pushes the competitive uh, you know, tips the competitive balance against our native plants. If we control deer overabundance, then our natives are actually quite competitive. This is what a healthy uh, forest understory looks like. This is the Great Smoky Mountains. I went there in the spring last year. And the first thing I noticed is they've got great understory. And I said, well, how are you managing your deer? And they said, we're not managing our deer. I said, what do you mean you're not managing your deer? I said, well, we've got black bears. We've got uh, bobcats. We've got coyotes they're managing our deer. So they don't have to do anything and have a very healthy forest. This is what the forest around, around here looked like. There's no understory. The deer have eaten it all. This is Japanese stilt grass that has come in. Um, it's a totally unproductive and, and not a sustainable uh, forest ecosystem. When these trees die, there's nothing to replace them because of the overabundance of, of deer. Of course, the other serious downside of deer overabundance is, is Lyme disease, which I have had five times. It's, it's a serious issue. So people say, how do we control our deer? We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. You can put the predators back. And there are certainly places in Maine where, they, where you can do that. Sharpshooters, very expensive, come into a neighborhood. They'll take about a third of the deer. Uh, but uh, that's not enough. Uh, but Bern Blossie at, at uh, Cornell is suggesting that we move to market hunting for, for deer. Um, that works really well. Think how well it worked with the, uh, the bison and the passenger pigeon and the Carolina parakeet and so many other things. So um, think about supporting market hunting. What should we do in the meantime? Well, you have to cage. If you want to plant and you want to keep it, you got to cage it because otherwise the deer will, will eat it. Okay, cropland. Got a lot of cropland out there. 410 million acres of cropland. This is where it's distributed. Uh, and you might think there's nothing we can do to cropland to increase its biodiversity value. But again, that is not true. There are four things we can do. We can manage the roadsides, the verges along that crop line productively. We can put hedgerows back wherever it's possible. We can add prairie strips and we can minimize neonicotinoid insecticides. We have lost the monarch butterfly. We're down now. This year, uh, the overwintering population in Mexico was the second smallest on record. Um, over 90, 90, 95 percent, something like that, uh, reduction in, in uh, monarch populations, largely because we have taken away the areas where they used to breed, which was along uh, agriculture areas in the Midwest. 
and converted all the, quote, weeds, milkweed, New York ironweed, goldenrod, asters, uh, into lawn, which has to be mowed, and then then all the carbon goes up in the atmosphere. Uh, so terrible hit on our, our monarchs, on our native bees, and so much other biodiversity. Um, but look, we can put it back. We can take that that the, that status symbol away, put the, the plants that belong there back. Uh, beautiful. And you know what? A lot of people are doing that. So that's that's great without touching yield at all. Put the hedgerows back wherever possible. Put the hedgerows, multi-species hedgerows filled with native plants, not non-native, not autumn olive, not Russian olive. Um, we took them out because big machinery doesn't like them. But there's a lot of places we took them out where they didn't need to be removed. It was a terrible hit on agricultural biodiversity. And finally, prairie strips. This is a great idea. They're working on it at, uh, in uh, Iowa State University, you put uh, a prairie strip right through your corn, right through your soybeans, perpendicular to the flow of water off the property. So not only does it help your pollinators, but it reduces topsoil loss by 95%, water pollution by 90%, and you get USDA CRP uh, uh, funding for this. So it's a win-win. No loss in, in, uh, in revenue for the farmer uh, and the ecosystem services um, are increased on his farming property. And then finally, we've got to reduce uh, the use of neonicotinoid seed coatings. They're 7,000 times more toxic to, to uh, insects than DDT was. Um, they're used preventively. In other words, whether you have an insect problem at all, you buy seeds that are covered with neonicotinoid. Only 5% is taken up by the plant. The other 95% washes off the seed into our local woodlot or it blows away on dust and we have no idea what it's doing there. Um, and when you compare the yield of a field where you use seed coatings with a field where you don't use seed coatings, there's no increase in, in, uh, in yield. So we're again, another thing we're doing, we're killing life around us for no reason. And then finally, rangeland, biggest chunk of land in the country uh, by far, 770 million acres of rangeland, four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle, but it can be done productively. Our grasslands all co-evolved with grazers. So grazing grasslands is, is uh, it's normal, it's natural. Uh, it increases plant diversity, but you can't overgraze. Uh, so we know that, we know that. Uh, and believe it or not, this, this is a, a, a um, experimental range in Nebraska that Cindy and I visited. Those, that's not bison, those are cattle. Uh, but look, it's not overgrazed. These are all uh, sunflowers. All the, the grassland birds were there. It was a really productive place. Put the beavers back, particularly in the Southwest, and keep the key cows out of the streams. Why are we talking about beavers in, in uh, rangeland? Well, you know, there used to be beavers everywhere. And when we trapped them out, uh, it removed the beaver dams and the streams all became scoured, incised. It dropped the water table, which made it extremely easy uh, in these very dry habitats to overgraze them. Um, so if you put the the either the beavers or beaver dam analogs back, it raises the water table back up, creates wetlands even in the southwest, uh, which are that's where the biodiversity is. That's where the the willows and the cottonwoods are. But you have to keep the cows out with fences so that they don't eat all of that stuff. All right. Now there's something common to each one of these conservation approaches. And that is whether or not they succeed depends on decisions you and I make. It really is a sociological issue. I had a student a couple of years ago in, in one of my classes during a final exam. She wrote, this is Amanda Crandall. While conservationists claim to be managing species and habitats, what we're really managing is people. So true. This is why we need to change our adversarial relationship with nature to a collaborative one. Uh, and the real question is, can we do this? Well, I certainly think we can do it. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. What can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn. One person can modify your lights. One person can add a pollinator garden. One person can put those container plants on their, their porch. One person can remove the invasive plants from their property, add keystone plants, fire your mosquito fogger, join homegrown national park, all of those things and totally revitalize the little ecosystem on your property and then enhance your greater local ecosystem rather than continuing to destroy it. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. 
you get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So I hope that Homegrown National Park can provide the motivation and the guidance for millions of people to tackle these conservation challenges. Whether or not we do this is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. So I'm going to leave you with the Homegrown National Park Challenge. I want you to plant one keystone plant this year. It'll take you 10 minutes. And you might think, well, gee, that's not going to help much. Uh, well, I want 400,000 of you to do it, and then it will help a lot. So thanks very much. Doug, thank you so very much for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I think um, uh, as the moderator, I will uh, take moderator's prerogative and ask the first question, which is if you could have people do one thing other than joining the Homegrown National Park or planting a keystone, of your list of things to do, what is it the lawns? What if you had to ask someone to do one thing, what would it be? Well, you know, the easiest one thing is to plant a tree. And if you put a bed under that tree, you've reduced the lawn at the same time. So when I say reduce the lawn, um, that can be a big, a big job. So I would pick at it. Just add a little bit each year. Each time you do that, that reduces the area that's lawn. And if you choose the right keystone plant for where you live, you've really boosted the biodiversity on your, your property. Uh, again, and, and plant those trees small. You know, I planted the oaks on my property as acorns. When I say it takes five minutes, it really did take five minutes. Uh, then I had to protect it from the deer, but you know, I'm still using the cages that I, I put in 23 years ago. I moved them around as I plant new things. Um, so it's it's not as hard as people think, and it doesn't have to be expensive. If you buy a 15-foot uh, tree, you've spent a lot of money, has a 50% chance of dying, and because they've got to cut off all the roots to move it. So start small, it'll grow. They grow much faster than you think. When I garden now, I garden with a chainsaw because I have planted way too much, and they I'm losing my light. <laughs> you diplomatically inform your neighbors of your principles? Mm. It is very hard to go to your neighbor and say, you know, you're not living right. You should be like me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard sell. I think the best thing to do is um, be a model. Uh, develop a landscape that's both attractive and, and productive. Uh, and without saying a word, you're modeling uh, what you believe to be correct. And you know, more and more people are doing this. Most people respond to peer pressure. They wanna do what their peers are doing. And when the neighborhood starts to get more and more people doing that, we're gonna reach a threshold where that becomes normal and the person not doing it is, is the abnormal one. We're seeing this already in California where they're trying to reduce the area in lawn because they don't have the water for it. So now the guy with the big lawn is the social pariah because everybody knows he's wasting valuable water on something that he shouldn't be wasting it on. So, um, so we do see the needle moving here. Uh, and but but the direct um, approach of your neighbor and saying you know you're just not doing it right is is probably the worst way to go about it. It is why I write the books. You know, stick a book in their their uh, mailbox and run and see what happens. But. <laughs> What species are most effective in cold climates like Maine? I'm assuming she means trees or maybe I, I, I can Karen Larson. Well, this is this is where the the native plant finder comes up because it, it's specific to your county. So as you move farther and farther north, it'll it'll come up with the trees that are most effective in your county. Uh, the farther north you go, the most effective tree becomes willows. Uh, believe it or not. But conifers, of course, are adapted to the, the snows that are, are common in the, the, the northern areas. Um, they support far fewer species, but they can support bigger numbers, uh, bigger, uh, you know, higher abundance of those species. Our warblers fly up to the boreal forests. Most of the warblers breed in the boreal forests. And you know what they're rearing their young on? Spruce budworm. It's one species, but it can be there by the zillions and they will increase their clutch size depending on the number of caterpillars available. 
So they can go from four up to nine because they can feed them all if there's a lot of, of uh, insects up there. So conifers can be productive in terms of abundance, maybe not in terms of diversity. Um, I'm also um, being asked to tell you that the Camden Garden Club, we have planted uh, several uh, in small native gardens um, and there's one at the post, uh, post office in Camden, Maine. Uh, so if anybody that's not a garden club member would look by, maybe they can just see we took a small patch right by the post office and planted some natives in to get rid of what was a, a blank little uh, field. Good. Um, um, we also have a question on the Q&A. Are there bad caterpillars? And I know in Maine, we, of course, have the brown tail moth caterpillar, which is a problem. We have we had dozens on our blueberry bush that were stripping all the leaves. What should you do in a case like this? There are bad caterpillars. Anything introduced from another continent, like the what was the gypsy moth is now the spongy moth, the brown tail caterpillar, the satin moth. These these are introduced species, the um, winter moth. Uh, and they're here without their natural enemies, so they all go crazy and they cause huge problems. There are several things that eat blueberry. Blueberries are really a productive plant. Um, and, and some of them are gregarious, which means when you have them, they will strip all the leaves. But the blueberries come back. I suspect it's a good native, native uh, insect that was stripping your blueberries. And I urge you to just tolerate it. It's not going to kill the blueberry. Your blueberry is doing its job by producing the moths that then support the bats that eat the mosquitoes and the nighthawks and the night the the whippoorwills and other things that need uh, nocturnal moths. Um, so it's part of the food web. We just have to tolerate it. Yeah. Um, another question uh, you referred to in, in controlling deer a, a concept called market hunting. Can you clarify what market hunting is? You get paid to hunt deer and, and the meat is sold. Um, that's what we did at the turn of the century and wiped out most of the biodiversity. But so, so right now we have hunting seasons, but they're seasons and it's designed to not control the deer. Um, this is, we've got to get the deer down below the carrying capacity. In my county, uh, they are 14 times over the carrying capacity. You've got about 140 deer per square mile. It should be around 10. Uh, and they're devastating the the local forest. So um, market hunting would would turn that into a resource until they you know, the populations are are depressed to what they used to be. Uh, now or or you know, bring the wolves back, bring the black bears back, but I know the issues with that. so I also have a question on the q and a. We live next to a golf course. Suggestions? Um. <laughs> It depends on how they're managing the golf course. Now, some golf courses are actually, they're, they're becoming a lot greener. They're minimizing their use of, of insecticides and herbicides. Um, and that's great. Uh, you know, there was, there was a statistic, nobody talks about it, but um, years ago, there was almost a straight line correlation between the incidence of prostate cancer in men and the amount of time they spent on golf course walking around on all that toxic stuff. So uh, I think golf courses have, have, have learned, we, we've got to minimize that, but um, so it depends on how they're managing it. But uh, a lot of people love living next to a golf course because it can be pretty, I guess. Uh, and there are, there are a number of records of bluebird trails along golf courses where the bluebirds love to forage in, in um, low actually grazed area. So they're the mowers doing the grazing. So they can be productive places, particularly in the rough. And more and more golf courses are recognizing that if their roughs are native plants, it's it's fine. There's trees and golf courses. They can be native trees. So, you know, find out who's managing the land and, and see, see if you can influence them a little bit. Um, I have a question here. Um, uh let's see and it just vanished for me but someone was wondering that uh they're we are losing so many hemlocks in pennsylvania where i live and in maine but nothing is being done about the hemlock yeah uh, well, and, we then, and how do you stay optimistic when it's the beech trees it's the boars it's everything is, and i think that's probably the gist of her 
question is it's very hard to get optimistic and to decrease your lawn when everything around you is dying by blights or insects or whatever. Do you have a, I mean, your whole talk, I guess, was sort of aimed at that, but. Right, right. Well, I know what she's saying. Um, uh, you know, the hemlock willy adelgid and the emerald ash borer and, and the beech blight, all the things that we have brought in, but we can't give up. We can't give up. We need these these trees. Uh, and there's actually good news with the, the emerald ash borer. Uh, we've got three or four parasitoids that are starting to control it in, in different areas. So, uh, you know, we've lost the ash forest, but um, a, lot of, a lot of young ashes out there, they can come back. Uh, so we're hoping to actually get control there. Have not managed to, to make a dent with the hemlock woolly adelgid yet. Biocontrol just hasn't worked, but people are still, still trying. Um, so, you know, don't give up. If you're in the middle of the ocean and your dinghy springs a leak, you're going to bail. And that's what we're doing now. We're, we're bailing, uh, but we're getting closer to shore. You know, it's, it's, remember, there's a lot of us out there. There's a lot of us out there. If you control things on your property and everybody did that, that's, that's our main message with Homegrown National Park. Um, then there are things to be optimistic about. I am optimistic because I've been talking about this for 20 years and I see vastly increased interest. Uh, and that's good. We're getting people on board to, to take action. Uh, that's going to influence how we vote. You know, when we vote, we're voting for, for people who are determining our future in terms of the environment. So make sure you vote in, in, for somebody who recognizes that uh, environment's important. So all these things are happening and, and I am optimistic. Look, you're on this this webinar right now. That makes me optimistic. Ten years ago, that wouldn't have happened. Thank you so very much. And I have a, one last question before I let you go. Um, you touched on something that I actually tried to get people to talk about this year, but I was unsuccessful. And that is the the topic of neonics or neonicotinoids. So, in the state of Maine, you're forbidden from bringing them in. I mean, oh. no, you're forbidden from selling them. But you can get your plants from nurseries in, in South Carolina that can be doused in it, and they're okay to sell here. And there is no labeling legislation. Like, we can't even know which plants have been treated with neonics. And I sort of couldn't get anybody to help us understand what's going on or or get some mojo going to to identify what I think is a significant problem and others up here don't think so. So I, I would like your take. Well, my take is to talk about it every chance I get and, and, and for people to say it's not a problem, show them all the ways that it is a problem. Um, we don't even recognize how big a problem it is. They're banned in Europe. They've recognized what the problem is. Uh, there are, I, just, I think it's Massachusetts. Um, there are states who are passing legislation uh, against their their use. The internet moving things all over the country is an issue, but but um, try to be responsible when you're when you're buying plants. Ask the grower, are you using neonicotinoids? If you are, I'm I'm going to buy it from someplace else. And growers are recognizing, you know, this is an issue with the public, and they're they're switching off. So uh, yeah, I don't have a ready ready solution to that, but. Um, there's more awareness now than there was, and that's step one. We're caught in the state of Maine because you can't sell it, but you can certainly import it, and they don't have to label it. So um, so I guess just sort of bullying the nursery people, if they can, to find out where, because it's very hard for the, us third parties to figure out kind of what to do. Yeah, but it I, is. It is. It is. I, I sympathize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We want to thank you so very much for the time you have spent. It's just been a phenomenal, phenomenal lecture. I've, I have pages and pages of notes and um, and we will certainly keep you all in mind and certainly promote you as often as we possibly can, because I think you're of the same mind as the Camden Garden Club, to be quite honest with you. We constantly try to do things that will better our little, our little postage stamp strip of the world. So um, without further ado, I'd like to thank you very much for coming and talking to us and answering our questions. And I'd like to tell the audience, this is the fourth in our series of five Winter Horticultural Series lectures sponsored by the Camden Garden Club and brought to you by the Camden Library. Um, our next one is next week. 
on the rising sea level and what to do with planting. So um, again, thank you very much. And um, I will turn it over to Julia for final farewells. Thank you so much, Doug. That was fantastic. Um, and I think a few people were asking in the chat, there will be a recording. Um, it will be posted on the Camden Public Library YouTube channel. Um, and I'll also link to Homegrown National Parks there. Um, and there's many comments coming in saying, thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. Excellent information. Thank you for spreading the good word, et cetera, et cetera. So. Well, thanks for the opportunity, everybody. <laughs> Take care. Yes. All right. Thank you, everybody. We'll be Bye -bye. back next week with our next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.